a, a bioinfiltration site. I'm not sure, but we might have invented that term here. Uh, we, it was Chicago in about the year 2000, and I was having a libation with a person who was doing a lot in Prince George's County, Maryland. And they're looking at their standard rain garden design, which at that time was six inches deep, uh, have an under drain for every single one, uh, sand soil at the bottom and gravel around the under drain and things like that. Well, we found this site and we're looking at it and we can't have an under drain because the bottom would be too far away from any pipe. And so we figured out, oh, if we're gonna throw out the pipe, well, we might as well throw out the layer of sand, might as well throw out the, all the geotextiles. So all we did was dug down, took the soil out, got concrete sand, and they had a big sieve. So we put a bucket load of soil and a bucket load of concrete sand and threw it back in. And throw a lever, layer of mulch on it and planted it using Pennsylvania, I'm sorry, South Jersey plants because they can handle wet, they can handle dry, and luckily they can handle chlorides. We didn't, I'm not going to pretend I thought of that at the time. I'm not going to claim, I did not get that thought in my head at the time. And then we did a couple curb cuts to get the water in. And the way we located that, we're very lucky. They were watering, putting sod in this area, and they were watering it. We watched where the runoff hit the curb, put two marks, that's where we put in the curb cut. And there's an inlet over here, which we got a hole in the inlet, brought a pipe in, and then we have a barrier to force the water in. If the water goes over that barrier, it's a V-notch where we can measure overflow. So that would be the overflow of the site. And that was in 2001. So far, we don't see any difference in infiltration rates measured by the water dropping after a storm event. Oh, we also don't believe in the six inches rule either for depth of, me of, of bowl above the media. This one is 18 inches deep. We have another one on campus that's three feet deep, but we really haven't studied it, unfortunately. Um, so, why don't you take it away and then we can talk, I'll talk more about what you don't want to talk about. Okay, um, just a little bit more about this site. Well, I guess my name is... I'm sorry, this is Laura Lord. Uh, I'm Laura, and this is my active research site that I monitor. Um, and my research specifically is I'm looking at the fate of nitrogen within our system. Um, it's 11 years old, so we have a decent amount of data. And I'm trying to determine what's the fate. Are we reducing? Are we loading? And initial results are pretty cool. Um, I think we are reducing our nitrogen loading. And it's mainly because we have an infiltration system. Uh, and we don't, I mean, as long as the storm size is relatively small, we infiltrate everything into the groundwater. Um, and what I do to kind of analyze that, I compare the samples that we take within the system. We have water samplers at zero feet, four feet, which is at the bottom of the cell, so it's a four foot media depth. And then we have another uh, sampler at eight feet deep, so that's kind of in the in situ soil. So that's neat because you kind of look at the soil profile. And then if you look over here, we also have some background lysimeters, or that's what they're called, water samplers. So I can compare my concentrations from within the bed to the background, and then there's also groundwater wells that we've taken some samples from. Um, so it's pretty cool research to be able to quantify what's going on here. And um, trying to think a little bit more about our watershed, I guess. I don't think we mentioned much about that. It's about an acre and a half, and it's roughly 50% impervious and 50% pervious and it's just you really walked into the new watershed when you when we crossed over out there on the path and then it includes a little bit of the grass area volleyball courts and things like that and everything within here so it's a residential um, area um, so we may have lower levels of nutrients than we would somewhere else um, but this is a site that we actively monitor uh, every time it storms we come out here, all the grad students, we take water quality samples and uh, we'll go to the lab and test for that. Um, so it's, it's a pretty old site, which is neat because we've had a lot of opportunity to um, study a lot of different parameters within it. Anything else to add? Oh, um, basically we've done a lot of studies here. We have a student that's looking at predicting the movement of water through using a little more engineered approach and it works pretty good. Uh, it's easy to say that we could always remove a certain volume. We always remove the volume of the bowl, and we always remove about a foot of water within the void space 
of the soil if there is any landscape architects, you know, between the wilting point and the, and the saturation. We always can show statistically, we always get rid of that water. So we can depend not just on the bowl, but in the void space within the root zone. So that's pretty cool. So it does better than just looking at the bowl, which everybody likes to depend upon. A uh, part of what Laura was talking about, about the, the fact that we get removals because of its uh, in infiltration, maybe because it's so slow here. A lot of people are trying to use engineered medias to speed the water through, but there's a question as whether it's too fast for denitrification to build up. So speed is not always, maybe not such a good thing. So there's a lot of stuff we're still learning here. Like for an example, this is four feet deep of a sandy mixture. Uh, we've already learned phosphorus removed in the surface. Uh, temperature is the surface. Metals are the surface. Nitrogen may be the one thing you need a little more time for. So it's kind of the question is on this type of site, whether we get the same performance if we made it two feet deep versus four feet deep. All right, so maybe, you know, there's a lot of stuff we're still looking at. We'll see a site in a few minutes where we're going to be looking at some of those issues uh, at the stormwater wetland where we're doing some more studies. Other interesting things about the site is we, from the wells, from the first study of the wells, we found water goes down. What I mean by that is we built wells right across the street there is a well. And the water surface there is about 10 feet lower than here, that close. And during a storm event, this will go up a foot or two. If you have like a one inch of rain, the groundwater will rise a foot. If you have two inches of rain, it's about two feet, I think, generally. Right down there, you don't see much of a difference. So the question is, how close can you get to these to the buildings? Andrea, who is at the porous concrete, porous asphalt site, and our grad student is not here, are doing a hydraulic model trying to take a look at this more. Because there's a big question in the cities, how close can I put this to a building? And right now, I saw one from Washington, and they wanted to make them 50 feet away from the building. Well, they're never going to build one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, so basically, it's a big question. There are concerns, like for an example, if you have a utility going through, that might be a pathway for water, or if there's lenses underneath. Um, but, you know, frankly, we found water goes down. So if you take a look at the surface of the bottom of the media going down, it may spread out a little bit to the sides, but it looks like it's pretty fast. Uh, we also see tremendous chloride increases right underneath here. We also see chloride increases underneath there. And we're wondering if it's just the snow being dropped on the grass, melting. So it's uh, by chloride, not tested for chloride, we test for conductivity, which is a pretty good surrogate of that. Uh, so, you know, a lot of things still to learn about these sites, but this is deeper than the standards. A bigger surface area than the standards from the road to the site. 11 years old, no change in performance. What's the ratio between the size of the 10 to 1. It's about 10 to 1. Uh, so it's a, if you take the basketball court, the street up to the top, and some parking over here, it works out to be about 10 to 1 to the footprint. So, you know, it's a, one of the biggest problems of rain gardens is, frankly, fitting them in the urban landscape. So we kind of, there is generally a rule you don't make it more than 6 to 12 inches deep. And we kind of figure, if I can make it 18 inches deep, I've now reduced a third of the size of the footprint. We first made it 6 inches deep, and we're kind of scratching our heads and this is ridiculous. So we just wave, raise the weir here a little bit to try to get a little more performance. Yeah? And you're a new nitrogen study, have you looked at the that's the one portion I haven't really um, looked at. I'm more interested in what's going on with the media. Um, we have another graduate student, I think, doing a little bit of vegetation studies, but um, it's been all of the process. Yeah, we've been trying to get, because it dawned on, on us a couple years ago, the university goes through, cuts down all these grasses and composts them every year, like they do all that stretch of ground there as well, which is not a rain garden. So the idea is how much nutrients, how much metals are they removing, is it significant? I don't know. We'd like to get to that. There's a lot of studies we'd like to get to. We had a other, some other interesting concepts. All the engineers here. Uh, there is piping that goes all along this traffic, all along that list of that little traffic island, I guess you'd call it, 
or that barrier, and there's about six inlets. How much do you think that would cost to put in? 24 inch pipes, all part. Couple thousand? Yeah. That probably, if we had done this and not as a retrofit, made that a little wider, make that a swale coming in and built it, we could build it cheaper than the quote unquote, I don't like this term, because I think this is the conventional method, the past conventional methodologies of doing it. And plus, maybe you could reduce the size of the flooding protection that you would need as well. So, uh, the overflow from this goes into an old detention basin. That's now a pretty, pretty good wetlands since you can't get to it and maintain it. And it looks like it's got some good wet vegetation. So nobody's here from the core, right? Okay. Another thing that would be 